Father's Word, 2 Kings, chapter 9. I hope that if you have uh, learned any one thing in this second book of Kings, it's that God always keeps his word. If he states something, friend, you can count on it. It's going to happen. And we come to that place in this chapter whereby he had said that he would destroy Jezebel, all of her offspring, Ahab, all of his offspring. Ahab repented to the point that he said, well, Elijah, I'll tell you what, we will wait until he's dead and gone, and then we'll do it. Well, then is, the, is now in this ninth chapter, and he's about to do it, all right? Uh, and as again, you got a lot of these weeping heart Christians that say, well, he's killing, God is destroying the children. They were worse than the parents. They're, talk about no goodniks. They, they are absolutely worthless. At least Ahab on prodding would say, well, we'll talk to a man of God. But the offspring didn't even think about consulting a man of God before they would go to war or anything else. They had their little idol temples and so forth. They were rotten. I can't put it any other way to describe them. So they deserve death. And that's what they're about to get. Chapter 9, 2 Kings, verse 1. Let's go with it. A word of wisdom from our Father, verse 1, and it reads, And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, that's one of the, this, this doesn't mean a child, it means one of the sons of the prophet. He would be a grown man, a young man. Gird up thy loins, and take this box, or better translated, flask of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Uh, and um, I, I want to say something about this word oil in the Hebrew, shikmen, but it, it comes from a prime, which is olive oil. I want to make that very clear. It's the oil of our people, olive oil. But its prime is a very interesting word. It's shaman. And I cannot help um, that word in the Hebrew, shaman. How did, how, why is it that we call all the priests shaman among the American Indians and the earlier, which shaman in the Hebrew tongue means to shine, one that shines. And of course, he's always pictured as one shining. And for one that is familiar with the Hebrew, there are many Hebrew words that we find in the uh, American native culture, and in Tennessee, the Bat Creek Stone, translated by yours truly, um, the being translated, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, let the uh, always faces east or right, as it's written in the scripture, let the let the voice of God be the poker that draws these firebrands back to him. And these were nine priests that were buried there. And then we begin to realize why that many of these Hebrew words were found in the early culture here. But it was just a very interesting point. And I wanted to bring this, the prime of the word oil, shaman to shine. And um, the shaman being the name of one that does shine, a religious leader. Verse 2. And when thou com comest uh, thither, look out there, Jehu, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, uh, Nimshi, that is, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren. Don't, don't do this publicly is what he's saying. And carry him to an inner chamber. Now, this is God's word being fulfilled from 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, chapter 19, verse 16, all right? I want to say it again. Ch uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16, whereby God told Elijah, at the same time he told him to pick uh, Elisha as his replacement, to go and anoint Haziel, king of Syria, which that has been done through Elisha, and to uh, anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And it's being done now through Elisha, but not Elisha only, a son of one of the prophets that Elisha taught. Now, uh, the names, you've got to be very careful. 
many would say, well, Jehoshaphat, the son of Jehoshaphat, he was the king of Israel. I'm sorry, king of Judah. But see, the king of Judah had intermarried a daughter of Ahab and um, vice versa until they were kind of mixed. So we, it would not be um, legitimate by God's promise to have taken a son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. So this is a different person. That's why I want to draw it to your attention. Uh, it brings a new line away from Ahab and Jezebel's families of that time. Why? Because we're going to kill them all, all right? That's plain and simple. Verse 3. Uh, then take the box or the flask of oil and pour it on his head. When you single out, get him, in, get him out of sight in the inner chamber. Pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have appointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. Now, it wasn't, he was not told this by our father through Elisha for fear for his life or anything but so that he himself, that is to say the prophet, would not become involved in any of their political situations. You know, all, all the prophet does is give the orders from our father as to how it's going to be. And our father brings that to pass. Let's take an example. As, he, as when all of Israel was starving, four lepers went to an Assyrian camp and found food there and, and saved the nation. God uses whomever he will, all right? But this, he did not want the prophet to be involved with their political or any other duties there. Deliver the message and leave, all right? Uh, verse 4. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, 5, and when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, um, unto which of all us? Now, um, and he said, to thee, O captain. I think it's important that you know that Jehu means living. And when it... I think I'll just take just a moment. I want you that study a little deep more in depth than others, I want you to remember something. Remember in the last lecture, I stated that the drought lasted seven, the famine was seven years long, and it has just now ended. And the Hebrew is very specific that it's the last seven years. So I can hardly, when the last seven is mentioned, seven years, I cannot help but think of the gap theory and the fact that it is a time for a cleansing when the Christ returns to this earth and destroys the rudiment. That is to say, everything that's evil is going to uh, be destroyed, done away with. And in a sense, with Jehu being, being the Hebrew word name uh, that means living, then Christ is the giver of all life, so to speak, then I hope you can see the type within this, and I think it will do you well to um, take that into consideration. Only Jehu is flesh and only a type, and he will not be perfect, but he'll get the job done. Okay. Um, now, uh, the next verse. We'll go to verse uh, 6. And he arose, and he went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Now, he was only a captain, but he was of the correct lineage, all right? Verse 7, And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Now, who uh, we've observed that Ahab kind of got twisted around, but who did God say? Because Je Jezebel was always whispering in Ahab's ear, and it was Jezebel that really gave the orders to slay the 400 prophets, priests. 
It was Jezebel that gave most of the orders. It was Jezebel that brought about the uh, death of Naaman and um, stole his property and uh, for dear old Ahab. And that will, that will play into this. God, if you, if you get any one thing from this chapter, God evens all scores to our favor, I might say, if we should call that even. Verse 8, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish. Now you understand why Jehu was not of that lineage, but of, of another line, rather. And I will cut off from Ahab him that urinates against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. All of them. We're going to kill them. Verse 9. And as I stated, don't let some weeping heart Christian um, question or challenge God. They deserve it. All right? Verse 9. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the, the calf worshipers, and like the house of Beasha, the son of Ahijah. And both houses were exterminated, as you will remember. 1 Kings 15, somewhere along 2029, 20, and, um, and through chapter 16, 13 on the other. Somewhere along in there, you'll find it. Um, God doesn't mess around. Many times you say, well, why? Why? How can this go on? Don't worry. It's not going to go on much longer. For God has his own time and place, and don't ever question it. Don't ever try to rush him. If you want to pray for the end, pray for it. But don't try to rush our Father. There is a, a reason for everything in relationship to the, to the time plan of our Heavenly Father. Verse 10. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel. And there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. He did exactly, now that's, that's obedience. He did exactly as he was told. Verse 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. And one said unto him, Is all well? He goes back in where the rest are sitting. Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? It was not unusual that they would call a prophet a mad fellow because uh, of their communication with God, perhaps being alone at times to seek and communicate with God. Um, it was not necessarily as disrespectful of what I'm, as what I'm trying to say as it might sound. And he said unto them, You know the man. You know he's a prophet and his communication. You know how he communicates with God. So, in other words, he's kind of saying, don't call him a madman, though, all right? Verse 12. And they said, it is false. In other words, it's not well. You're not leveling with us. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Now, it might do you well to observe how they accept this anointing from one they would call a madman, and you'll understand why I made this statement that I did uh, in relation to that. 13. Then they hasted, they hurried, and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. All right? Now, it was customary in this time that one that was of royalty that they would lay material, uh, carpet, uh, maybe our term lay out the red carpet. Uh, it was obvious because of the haste there was no carpet or um, royal cloth available so they took their own cloaks and didn't lay them under themselves. They laid them upon the naked steps, all right? whereby Jehu forming an altar and throne, rather, uh, by the steps in this uh, splenda, so to speak, making a, a, a temporary throne for him and declared him king. So they, they did not argue with what the prophet stated. 14. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshah, again reported so that you don't confuse it with the king of Judah, 
conspired against Joram. Now, Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Haziel, king of Syria. In other words, he had, he had troops there, and he kept a garrison there because they were at war, not doing too good in as much as he had been wounded, verse 15. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Haziel, king of Syria, and Jehu said, if it be your minds, if we can agree on this, let, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it to Jezreel. In other words, I don't want, in other words, the king, Joram, is situated there in uh, Jezreel, Samaria, and Jehu doesn't want the word to get out because what? Surprise is 80% of victory. 16. So Jehu rode in a chariot and he went to Jezreel for Joram lay there and a, a, a Hazai, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. I mean, we got both of them right there the king of Judah and the king of Israel. And uh, two intermarried in the family whereby they've got to be destroyed, both of them. 17. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company, I see an army. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them and let him say, is it peace? I mean, this is something that any good general would do when he sees an army approaching. I would assume from the direction in which they were traveling, he would not be overly concerned, but still in his state of weakness, uh, he would want to know. And at that distance, it was impossible to identify them, 18. So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And you understand, that's a figure of speech that simply means, are you here for peaceful reasons or? And Jehu said, what hast thou to do with peace? He states to this um, rider, turn thee behind me. Don't you dare go back in front of me. You get to the back. And the watchman told, saying, and the one up on the tower, saying, the messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. In other words, he's not coming back. And he wouldn't have because they forced him to the back, and no doubt he was well um, protected at that time unless he joined them, and he may have done that, 19. Then, speaking of the king of Israel, he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. It's almost like saying, get behind me, Satan, because there was not any peace in Jehu's heart with this bunch of idolaters, all right, that was destroying Israel from, away from the love of God and the following of God's plan. Verse 20. And the watchman told, saying, this porter back up in the tower again, saying, he came even unto them and cometh not again. He's not coming back. And the driving, or, or this marching, is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshe, for he driveth furiously. In other words, Jehu didn't do something halfway. He said, I can almost tell you who it is by the look of the marchers and the speed in which they're marching. Well, Jehu was one of them. They, they wouldn't necessarily be on guard just because of that, 21. And Joram, this being the king of Israel, said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, both of them, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu 
and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? I, I want you to see how God brings things right down to a pinpoint. Naboth the Jezreelite is, was the owner and the inheritor, his rightful field. It just so happened that it was next to Ahab's garden, and Ahab wanted this man's garden. It was fruitful, and he wanted it for himself. And Ahab asked him, said, hey, I'll give you a fair price, or I'll give you a better piece of land somewhere else. And this man said, no, it's my inheritance from my families and generations. And, and that was a no-no because, um, quite frankly, it, it melts right back to the reason we serve God. It's our, it's our um, inheritance. And if you do not consider your inheritance to be important, I'm sorry. Uh, I, by this, I mean your family name, um, your family um, uh, ways. Uh, that, that's supposed to be important. If you're Christian born and Christian raised, you take, uh, you take uh, I don't want to use the word pride, but I'll, I'll use it anyway, which will offend some. You must be proud of that fact. It means something to you. You would not sell it. Well, anyway, Jezebel takes it by having two lying false witnesses say that he cursed the king and God and killed Naboth and all of his sons, innocent people. And God brings these two turkeys right down to the middle of the garden, and it's not Thanksgiving, but these turkeys are about to get it, all right? Now, again, note, God doesn't miss a stroke, all right? We're on Naboth's property, and I'm sure Naboth is up in heaven on the Father's throne, the, the one that has been murdered always has the right uh, um, to, uh, to uh, applaud when the one that murdered them is about to get the ax and God's going to bring them up and probably, probably the one that has been murdered is going to say to hell with him. And you know what? That's exactly where he will go. Because, um, you know, God is always fair. But he'll repent won't do him any good. Christ himself said repentance won't help you on that one, if you understand the Greek of Matthew 5. So before anyone murders someone or takes someone's heritage, I would think twice, because you're probably giving yourself a one-way ticket to hell. God is a very serious, fair, and it is fair, you know? If you take a man's line for his heritage, that's very serious. And um, our father, quite frankly, is not for it. But I really, I really, I, that's why I think our father almost has a sense of humor, that he would bring them back to this spot where the tragedy took place, all right? Verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? Whoa, I mean, he's coming down hard on them in a spiritual sense. This means your idolatrous hearts. And when a man of God begins to talk like that with authority, the fear of God was placed in the hearts of these misfits and uh, cruddy idolaters, whoremongers that they were, verse 23. And Joram turned his hands. That means he pulled the lines on the chariot to turn it, whirl it around and fled and said to Ahaziah, that would be the king of Judah, there is treachery, O Ahaziah, there is deceit, they've deceived us. Um... And it's, it's real strange because a hazy eye means sustained by the Lord. And unfortunately, his Lord wasn't the Lord God Almighty. He wasn't what his father David's Lord was. If you want to be protected, you better make sure that you serve the correct Lord. Verse 24, 
And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength. He put the full whoop to it and smote Jehoram between his arms. This is Joram. Remember, I've told you in the Hebrew, the both words are the same. They're simply split up because there was one name of Israel and one of Judah, both the same. And the arrow went out at his heart, and he sank down in his chariot, deader than a hammer, all right? God's word always comes to pass, and he died on the very ground that Ahab had ordered at Jezebel's uh, conniving, the deaths of innocent um, Naboth and all of his children, 20, so that no one else would be there to inherit the land. You got it? It's hap you pass your own sentence many times to God when you pass something off on someone else, all right? You put somebody else in hell by knifing them and cutting them up and, um, and destroying their lives by putting them through hell, they're going to send you to hell, all right? There are no unsolved mysteries with our Father. And the people that were slaughtered are there waiting patiently for you that would do things like this. Again, our Father is very fair, and there is always a payday with him. And friend, this is payday. He's leveling it out. And there's another payday coming very soon, 25. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain. I like this because Bidkar means son of stabbing, all right? And it's the Lord, sword of the Lord they're going to get stabbed with in the end generation, okay? Take up and cast him in the portion of of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite, for remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab, when we were paired up as we rode by twos, his, uh, Ahab his father, the Lord said, this burden upon him. In other words, when he passed the sentence for Naboth and his sons to die, that the same thing would happen to him. He said, we can both remember God saying this, 26. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. This, in, this plat is a very interesting plat. I feel that in the hereafter, you're going to be very, if you're one of God's election, you're going to be very familiar with this plat. Verse 27. And when Ahazi, I'm sorry, Ahazi, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the guardhouse. He's running. All right. The king of Judah. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Iblium, uh, Iblium um, um, devouring of the people or divulging of the people. Uh, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. It's interesting because Megiddo is the gathering place of the crowd in the Hebrew tongue. And have you ever heard of Ormigedon? Well, Armageddon takes place, Megiddo, or the city or the hill of Megiddo, Armageddon, all right? So you see um, a little peek into the future here for those that like a little deeper study. Think about it. Verse 28, and his servant carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem. Watch this now. I want you to see how fair God is. And buried him. He at least was buried in his sepulchre with his fathers in the city of David. Why? Because of God's respect for David, a man after God's own heart. 20, and also, he did not participate in the foulness that the house of Israel did. 29. Well, he participated, but he at least, uh, he was there by compassion for his brother. 29. And in the 11th year of Joram, the son of Ahab uh, began Ahaziah the reign, uh, to reign over Judah. 
And uh, there again, the chronological order of the kings. Listen carefully, verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and um, tired her head, adorned best a little headpiece she could find, painted up those eyes. This was with, a, uh, it was called by the Arabs, letting the eyes. It meant there was a black line drawn around to make uh, them look better. Um, it's, um, let's see, what is that? It's, um, it's in the, um, what tongue? It's mascara, all right, uh, for the, those deeper students, all right? It's like, a lot like, no, mascara's for the lashes, isn't it? Oh, well, be that as it may. Anyway, she prettied herself up and looked out at a window with the lettuce. She's, she's uh, really, she's heard. She knows that, um, that uh, her grandson, where it says um, Jezebel heard of it, it was the murder of her grandson she heard about. So she's prettying herself up to either die like a queen or try to stand her ground, all right? Verse 31, and as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, had Zimri peace who slew his master? In other words, uh, is it peace with you, murderer? In other words, <laughs> She was slamming at him, and of course, this is recorded in 1 Kings 16, 9, all right, Zimri, all right, for, where the same thing was accomplished. Verse 32, and he lifted up his face to the window, Jehu did, and said, who is on my side? Up to the window. Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. 33, and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. In other words, uh, Jezebel's blood, when she hit the ground, splattered even on uh, Jehu's horses. And he trod her, trod her in underfoot. 34. Now, I, I watch this closely. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink. I'm sure he was very tired. And said, go see now this cursed woman. Go, go get her and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. Now, Jehu knew better than that. This was not as God's prophecy. She was not to have a burial. The dogs would eat her, all right? Uh, because, I mean, 400 of God's very best, she maliciously and with a wicked heart had them murdered. God was not happy with this woman at all. And there were 400 souls in that lot alone that were waiting for her. Verse 35. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. What does that mean? In other words, her filthy work, that's what the hand represents, was so bad that even the dogs wouldn't eat it. And her feet that were left with her travels and the events that she did that carried her were unfit for consumption by even a dog. And the cage that had held her brain, the skull, was so foul that uh, they didn't even con crush it and consume it, all right? As you can see, God was very unhappy with this person. 36, wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbe, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. You see, Jehu knew that. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. In other words, she was turned into dog dung, so they couldn't put a monument up and say, here lies Jezebel. 
Our Father is very graphic at times. Do not um, shy away from that, but let, let it settle in your heart that he means business. And many of these weepers and tender hearts that would say you can be forgiven for anything, forget it. For there is the unforgivable sin for God's elect. And there is 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 that stipulates that a murderer can never possess in his heart eternal life. Meaning he's got to wait. Father says, when a murderer kills someone, send him to me. I don't want you to feel bad about it or have any regrets. But let the, let the grief or, or, or let the guilt fall upon me, Almighty God. In other words, he ordered it. Because to him there is no guilt. And then others will see when it's done publicly, and these things will cease to happen among you. That's God's way. So he's very serious about that. And uh, I know it may seem that I'm stressing that, but I don't want you to be stressed out on the carrying out of God's sentence on worthless scum that doesn't deserve to live. They need to be sent to the Father, whereby he will either iron it out or do away with them. That's the way it works. That's God's way. Well, I thought that Jesus could forgive any sin. I'm sure if he wanted to, he could. But he stipulated in Matthew chapter 5, and I know that not all of you are Greek readers, so I'm going to help you because you may have a little trouble. And I, don't want, I want this to be very clear because I have stressed this enough, and it might be the little pastor that wanted me to read Isaiah out of Isaiah 45 and see the word evil, and it's ra in the Hebrew instead of raha, which means, uh, in other words, he's not doing his homework, and, and you were there, all right? So, for the sake of time, Matthew chapter 5, Christ teaching, verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. What they say goes. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to see that it's done right. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, that's one little dot that makes an E, an E, or an uh, or one tittle shall in any wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Blood ritual, yes, but not the law, my friend. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the, these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you plant seeds? Do you teach them? For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, if you can't do better than they did, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And of course, he trans it is mistranslated. The commandment was, Thou shalt do no murder. There's a great deal of difference in killing and murder. Your Greek here is phony, but the prime is phonyons, which means criminal, homicide, or murderer. Thou shalt do no murder, and whosoever shall murder shall be in danger of the judgment. In other words, you've got to wait till you get there by the law, to be judged by Almighty God. That's why he said to, to uh, execute murderers and send them to him, because they cannot, no way, by law and by the mouth of the prophets and by the word and the mouth of Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, can a murderer have forgiveness on earth. It won't happen. Sorry. I know you may have a lot of these bleeding heart... Um, uh, jailhouse freaks that come down and cry and moan and groan with you, but I'm sorry, you've already, I'm talking about an habitual criminal that will kill a young child, male or female, and put them through all sorts of torture. Our father has got your number, son. And I don't care what court on this earth makes some decision, you're guilty in heaven and you're going to answer for it, regardless of what man judges you. 
And I say, amen. More power to our Father. This earth is going to be cleansed of vimen. This earth is going to be cleansed of that that will not repent. So therefore, I would say to those that commit a heinous crime, you better think twice. Even though the courts are letting you off almost scot-free in this generation, hey, there's a court coming that I guarantee you, you're going to pay the full price. It's going to happen, and it's not that far away. And I say praise God and thank Messiah for declaring the real facts concerning the law. So Jezebel got what she had coming to her. No burial place and just dirt in the field where the dogs run. That's what, that's what taking advantage of other people will do for you in God's eyes. All right.